Hello there. I think there is no greater pleasure on earth than doing dangerous things with competent people, and so I am so honored to be among your ranks. Thank you so much to all the goons and to the conference for having me. I know I'm a little bit of an untraditional talk. What I have to say may thrill you, it may shock you, it may even horrify you. What I am not going to do today is try to provide a case for why sex work is or is not moral. Instead, what I would like to convey is why this warrantless surveillance is not only an erosion of our collective civil liberties, but it also presents a clear and lethal danger to those in the sex trade. So this is a very... Uh, a chant that's near and dear to my heart. When sex worker rights are under attack, what do we do? Get dressed, fight back. And who am I? I've done a thing or two around the world. I have been on the board of directors of the Sex Workers Outreach Project USA doing national organizing. I have spoken around the world on sex worker rights. Harm reduction is also a cause that is near and dear to my heart. I also do birth work, and I'm an apprentice death worker. So home funerals, births, I got everything. So what is SESTA-FOSTA? This is a piece of legislation that was signed into law by Donald Trump on April 11th, 2018. It is the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. It kind of converged into one piece of horrible legislation that has had all kinds of effects, um, resulting in 150 at least documented tech actions. Uh, this has involved Craigslist. If any of you have been trying to find a date on Craigslist, you probably have had some trouble. Uh, many other websites have also been shut down or censored. We're seeing an increased amount of shadow banning um, or outright removal of sex workers from services. So what is this? Essentially what this legislation did is it eliminated Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This means that websites are now um, have increased liability for any third-party content that is posted. Uh, so even if a website doesn't know that someone may be buying or selling sex on their website, they are now uh, going to be in trouble for that. This means that there's increased scrutiny on speech online, and uh, it's had, as I said, tremendous effects some of which have also been surprising. It was uh, pretty horrifying to see the ripples of people who were getting deleted from Twitter, but a group of sex workers decided to create a Mastodon instance they called Switter. It was up for a few days, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people flocked there. In fact, it was one of the largest instances of Mastodon. It was hosted by Cloudflare, and Cloudflare has been very vocal about privacy and freedom. They have only ever terminated uh, services for one client, and that was the Daily Stormer. They shut down Twitter. They shut us down, and that is quite a disappointment because what was Twitter, but essentially a group of women, trans women, and uh, male workers who were trying to save their own lives. So to be equated with something like the Daily Stormer was quite a slap in the face, especially from people who have been such like crusaders and vocal outspoken people about why we need spaces like this. And what influenced this is a philosophy known as the Nordic model. So up till now, we've really had criminalization, which is where we say, uh, you can't do that, it's bad. People go after the sex workers, they go after the buyers. Uh, in New Zealand, you have a model called decriminalization. And decriminalization is when you remove criminal penalties from any buying or selling. Uh, in fact, the United Nations has had a few people who have gone on the record saying, if you want to be a sex worker anywhere in the world, do it in New Zealand. Some people have said that the Nordic model is a middle ground because it criminalizes the buying, but not the selling of sexual services. It is guided by the idea that you can end demand for sex. Uh, this is actually a little bit difficult. Uh, Sex work has been going on for a very, very long time. As long as there are haves and there are have-nots, negotiations will occur between the two parties. And while I agree it's very important to protect people who may be vulnerable to exploitation, I think we need to do a little bit more of a careful look at why anyone is so vulnerable to that kind of economic exploitation in the first place. 
And here again, here's one of the quotes from some of the uh, lovely law enforcement officers talking about what they're trying to accomplish. They're really hoping that they can end demand, and if they can just end this demand, nothing bad will ever happen ever again. So we've seen a move from the model of criminalization uh, of the bad girls into the sad girls, the victims of trafficking, rather than women who have gone astray. And this, again, does sound tempting. It does sound like something that's going to be better or is going to be helpful. And yet, it's important to remember that asymmetric enforcement of a law will always infringe on the fundamental rights of the non-criminal party. There is no way to enforce laws like this without impacting sex workers themselves. And in fact, laws like this make sex workers more vulnerable. We've seen this around the world, especially in Sweden, where this was uh, originated. There was no research that went into this. There was no communication with those in the sex trade about how to implement it or how to enforce it. And it drives negotiations into a system where the worker has to protect the buyer. It makes it a lot harder to get information, to screen. Um, it essentially drives things further underground and further away from resources. It also comes with a lot of baggage because someone who could be profiting from sexual labor can be also uh, a landlord. There are people that are being kicked out of their homes. If you have two or more sex workers in any given location, that is a brothel or a body house that is illegal. So you can't work together. You can't live somewhere. And those who are being accused of being uh, traffickers are often partners, they are parents, they are children, and they are friends and they are not being distinguished from those who have ill intent. It's been a very popular thing outside of Nordic countries. This is a map of the continental United States where end-demand programs have been implemented. I couldn't quite fit the slide quite right, but this is happening in Alaska and Hawaii as well. And you can see how much it's spread. And yet, as we all know, if you build a better rat trap, you will always have a better rat. Sex workers are really very good at evading uh, any type of law enforcement because their lives and their livelihood depends on it. So every time there's ever been something, uh, a barrier erected, there are sex workers who have figured out how to go around it. We do the best we can, but sometimes this new legislation makes it a lot harder. There's been a lot of surveillance on sex workers. It goes back quite, quite a great of time back. Um, in the 60s, they started doing uh, uh, buyer stings. So instead of focusing on the sellers, they were looking on getting clients or johns. Um, the first internet-based buyer sting was in Everett, Washington. They began publishing names of people in the newspaper in the 70s. The Dear John letter campaigns encouraged neighbors to provide information about who they'd seen, license plate numbers, and they would send notices to homes that were actually designed to be opened by wives or mothers. So if you can't arrest somebody, you can always shame them. We started seeing surveillance cameras that were put in areas that were known for uh, any type of commerce. And yet, by coincidence, these were often low-income neighborhoods or neighborhoods of color. There is just as much sexual commerce happening at the Ritz-Carlton as there is at a Motel 6 off a highway but you don't always see the same kinds of surveillance there. Neighborhood actions targeting Johns were a lot of groups and community groups that were teaching people how to do this. And since then, we have seen license plate readers erected um, and many other forms of intense surveillance. A human rights attorney in San Leandro, where a large neighborhood action was set up, had a great quote, this turns neighbors against neighbors, and it recruits people to become spies for the police. It makes us suspicious of each other. It makes us create arbitrary ideas for who should be in a neighborhood and who shouldn't. Uh, and as we'll continue to see, these designations are. They're arbitrary and they're capricious. There's only two things that distinguish commercial sex from recreational sex. That is communication and association. Unlike other crimes, it's hard to actually pinpoint something. I don't necessarily agree with the drug laws on our books, but either you have drugs on you or you don't, or they were planted. If you kill somebody, we can do forensics to find out a body and how it came to be dead. If you steal money, there's a trail. But again, with sex work, that's a little bit harder. So people are often targeted 
for the way they are dressed, where they are standing, and who they're associating with. And again, this is what makes it so arbitrary. We've seen people that have been um, arrested and searched, and condoms that they've had on their person have been used as evidence against them. Condoms. Those are legal. They're sold everywhere. And this is dangerous when you consider HIV and STIs and STDs. If you're going to be penalized for having protection, why would you carry it? And uh, the Department of Homeland Security has been increasing a lot of uh, their own types of outreach campaigns. I was looking at the uh, Twitter stream, and I noticed a lot of people were very upset that their rooms were being searched. Providers have been following this for a long time. Some of their training includes uh, targeting the uh, janitorial staff, the hospitality staff in general. And uh, you'll note on the left-hand side, point two, presence of multiple computers, cell phones, pagers, credit card swipers, and other technology. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And in fact, it's even a little bit more detailed. It may be hard to read some of this, but they include other very arbitrary things like declining cleaning, a strong smell of musk, men coming and going, drugs and alcohol, pornography. There's a lot of reasons why you may be enjoying your hotel stay. It doesn't mean that you're a human trafficker. And again, who is going to be targeted more specifically for having or behaving in a manner like this? Another thing that I noticed that really stood out to me is that on all of these flyers and all of this training that is being provided, people are told and encouraged not to approach a suspected victim. They are told that the first thing they should do is contact ICE, Immigrations and Customs. And that was really very curious. ICE has been very involved in a lot of this. And a lot of that is because people do migrate to do sexual labor. Uh, it's not always going to be as profitable to work in your own home country. Sometimes you travel to work, and that is the case for many people in the sex trade. They're not necessarily being forced against their will. They're just following the money. They're doing the best they can. And we have these raids. They're called rescues. But there's no cocoa. There's no teddy bears. There's no one there to help you. Instead, it's going to be incarceration or deportation. And prostitution is a deportable offense. So out of one side of their mouth, they're using this terminology of victims and rescue. On the other hand, there doesn't seem to be anything in place that actually makes this a rescue. There's only 150 beds in the whole United States that are designated for human trafficking victims. 150 beds. And yet sometimes there are raids that have 150 individuals in any given raid in any given specific location. I also found it very curious that there has been a campaign to talk to university students. That is the item that you see on the uh, right. Uh, I don't know very many human traffickers that are like, going to exploit someone sexually, but they want them to get a good college education. But that's what this uh, image seems to imply. It says to beware of people who are getting a lot of gifts and male attention and seem to have a handler who won't let them out of their sight. I've never seen this on a campus, though it may happen. And again, students are being encouraged to call ICE. The National Overview of Prostitution and Sex Trafficking Demand Reduction Efforts had a report in 2012. I recommend reading it. It's a really horrific document. And it outlines that there just simply isn't anything there for those who may be rescued or may actually be a victim. While it is necessary and just to assist survivors, an expansion of those services is acutely needed, the interventions are not designed to prevent or reduce the occurrence of exploitation. Big Mother is watching, and she wants to end demand, no matter what kind of damage or casualty there may be. Some of these stings are also very, very brutal in general, and pretty much most of them are. At some of the raids in the United Kingdom, uh, press was called ahead of time, and the uh, victims were dragged out into the street without any opportunity to cover themselves. They were still in negligee and lingerie. That doesn't sound like a rescue effort to me. And in one of these cases, uh, a lot of law enforcement found that it would be a little expensive 
to actually pose as an escort. You have to rent a room. You got to post these ads and they're asking for money and there's this budget. They actually found it was a lot easier to find someone who was legitimate, who was working in their own room and uh, remove the survivor and install a police decoy. So what happens to this survivor? Was she cooperating? She has her phone seized and uh, all of her appointments for the day, things that were negotiated in good faith are gonna run afoul. And most of this law enforcement response has really been driven by complaints from people rather than any actual concern. We know that at least 71% are definitely from complaints, but it's likely much higher. And public shaming, this could be billboards posting pictures of buyers or sellers, um, or having a Dear John campaign, uh, will like drop those complaints. So officers really like that. It makes it very convenient. And again, no punitive response up to and including the death penalty has ever effectively halted commercial sex at any time in history. So we know that it's not actually doing anything to stop this supposed problem. It's just a great cover-up or a band-aid. And what kind of things have we lost? This is a screen cap from my pink book. This was a side message board of my red book, which was a California-based message board. It was where ads were posted. And uh, as you can see, this is, this is the type of speech that was being halted. This is health information. These are legal services. This isn't necessarily trafficking at all. This is sex workers helping sex workers. It was also a place where sex workers were able to become more independent. Uh, in the past, a pimp has been necessary uh, because there's so much work that goes into things. If you're arrested, who's going to bail you out? If you need security, who's going to provide it? Who knows where you are and what you need? So oftentimes, sex workers have been employees of people. But with the rise of the internet, they were able to become a boss and were able to hire out the services they need. That could be a driver. That could be a lawyer. That could be someone who knows how to make paychecks and pay stubs if you need to rent something. And so it was incredibly powerful to be able to be in charge rather than to be a worker. We also know in a recent study that the Craigslist erotic services reduce the female homicide rate by 17.4%. That's incredible. Purely by virtue of having a place where people could meet clients and screen them, the overall homicide rate dropped. We're here at this conference and we all know that it's not necessarily safe to answer an email, but it's a lot safer to answer an email than it is to stick your head in a car window. So if you'd like to see that, I really recommend you read it. And in San Francisco, even these are uh, people who were proponents of a Nordic model noted that the average yield of arrests per street level sting fell by half between 2004 and 2007. That's when Craigslist became popularized. So actually the bout of street-based traffic dropped. It dropped considerably. Because even though we're talking about using computer and digital services, smartphones became much more uh, uh, available to people. And most providers were able to post ads uh, and work on the street, or just move indoors entirely. In fact, on the street in general, there are oftentimes people who will have their ad posted, they'll have a room waiting, and if they're not getting any business, maybe they'll go downstairs, but pretty much everybody was using the internet. And this is a dangerous job. Being a sex worker is the most dangerous job in America. So when we talk about this reduction in, uh, in numbers, it's a very, very large and uh, thing. It's no small feat. Women represent 22% of all homicide victims, but 70% of serial killer victims. This is why December 17th, the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, was started. The Green River Killer made it very clear who he was targeting and why. Sex workers are 18 times more likely to be a victim of homicide than other women, and 50% of sex worker homicides will go unsolved. This is a community that doesn't have any justice and the one tool that they had to protect themselves was ripped out from underneath them. I have some of my sources up here, and if you'd like to check some of them, which I hope you will. And I hope you will always scrutinize the statistics that you hear because so many of them have been based in falsehoods. 
The average age of entry into the sex trade is not 12 years old. It's closer to 19. It is safer to have these message boards, not more dangerous. And even though I'm saying some pretty harsh stuff, I'm a sex worker, so you know I believe in happy endings. <laughs> I've seen us have success when people stand up with us and fight back. I have seen bad laws in California struck down. I have seen change made. So I believe that the more people know and the more people are willing to speak up to their politicians and their law enforcement communities, that this can be reversed and we can have an internet that is safe for sex workers, where the civil liberties of all of ours are protected, and uh, we can all have our happy ending. Thank you very much.